This morning, new concerns over ISIS threats in Afghanistan. Palestinians have fired hundreds of rockets into Israel, which has responded with devastating airstrikes. Terror from the sky has forced the Israeli military to ramp up its offensive against Hamas. This could escalate quickly. Palestinians are rising up inside and outside of Israel. Hamas is taking credit for bringing the two together. We turn this evening to the urgent warning. Now that four countries are on the brink of famine, 20 million people, families and children. At least 29 people were killed when a 7.2 magnitude earthquake struck Haiti on Saturday. Inside these refrigerated trailers here are the bodies of 750 people who died at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over this series, we've looked at Israel, we've looked at the Middle East, we've looked at Russia, we, uh, we've looked at all the key players that uh, are in end times prophecy, but this week it gets personal for you and me, because we're looking inward rather than outward. And the thing is that when you open the Bible and you study the end times, there is no mention at all of our nation in prophecy. Our country, that has been a superpower and the most powerful nation on this planet for years, is not mentioned. So where do we fit in prophecy? Or maybe a more fitting question is, will America survive? Dr. Carly Zimmerman, professor of sociology at Harvard University, wrote a paper called Family and Civilization, and what he did is he identified the symptoms of final decay that was observable in the fall of both the Greek and the Roman civilizations. As you listen to these, just see how many characterize our society. No-fault divorce, increased disrespect for parenthood and parents, defamation of past national heroes, acceptance of alternative marriage forms, widespread attitudes of feminism, narcissism, hedonism, propagation of anti-family sentiment, acceptance of most forms of adultery, rebellious children, Increased juvenile delinquency, common acceptance of all forms of sexual perversion. In 1787, a, a Scottish history professor named Alexander Teitler observed the following about the longevity of a democracy in his book, Democracy and the Fall of the Athenian Republic. I quote, a democracy is always temporary in, nation, in nature. It simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidate who promises the most benefits from the public treasury with the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to a loose fiscal policy, which is always followed by a dictatorship. The average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. During those 200 years, these nations always 
progressed through the following sequence. From bondage to spiritual faith. From spiritual faith to great courage. From courage to liberty. From liberty to abundance. From abundance to complacency. From complacency to apathy. From apathy to dependence. And from dependence back into bondage. Let's talk today about the question, will America survive? I begin in your notes with a quote by Dr. John Walver, the former president of Dallas Theological Seminary. He said, and I put it in that box there, the destiny of nations is in the hands of the omnipotent God. I want you to think about that for the moment, that true statement. The destiny of nations, any nations, doesn't rest in the ballot booth, doesn't rest in the economic uh, a situation of a nation doesn't rest in the military power. The destiny of any nation rests in the hands of the omnipotent God. I begin with some introductory statements for this message. The first one is this. Number one, America has been enormously blessed by God. So let's just nail that truth right off the bat. We know that. We talk about the fact, I would imagine the great majority, if not all of us, have said it sometime in our lifetime, America is the greatest nation on this planet for various reasons, whether it is the ability to, uh, to, to, to make as much money as you want, to live wherever you want, to have the freedom that you have. America has been enormously blessed by God. Number two, America may well be at the zenith of her power and influence in this world. And if that be true, folks, if America is at the zenith, there's only one way to go. And if that is the case, then the time is short. And I would say, as I've said a couple of times during this series, the cause for evangelism is urgent. Urgent. Say the word Urgent. It is urgent. We can't be complacent about this thing of evangelism because the door may close soon. Number three, God has been extremely long-suffering with our nation. Now, you know, most people, will, when they think about long-suffering, they'll say, well, that means suffers long. The word long-suffering comes from two Greek words. First one meaning long, and the second one meaning temper. God has been very, very patient. That's part of his character. He's been patient to this nation. But his long-suffering, folks, can come to an end, like it did with Sodom and Gomorrah. So the question that I want to ask, I think it's good to get this right at the beginning of this message, and I put this in your notes, in the midst of moral and spiritual decline in our nation, why has God's judgment been withheld? When you take a look at the moral climate in this nation, when you look at the spiritual decline in this nation, why has God withheld his judgment? I suggest to you two reasons. Number one, global evangelism. The United States of America makes up less than 5% of the total world population, and yet in the 20th century, and thus far in the 21st century, more than 50% of the missionaries around the world, and more than 50% of the money spent on missions comes from this country. So I think one of the reasons is global evangelism. Because you know, my Bible tells me that Jesus came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. God sent that baby himself wrapped in human flesh so that people might have an opportunity to spend eternity with him. But there's a second reason, and that is the Abrahamic covenant. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God said to Abraham concerning 
the nation of Israel. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that covenant was unconditional. God made it by himself. Abraham wasn't a part of that. God says, I give you my word. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. It was unconditional and it was everlasting. But there is a fact when it comes to end time prophecy. And I put it right there. America is never mentioned. Does that seem strange? That the most powerful superpower in the world, the most prosperous nation, the freest democracy is never mentioned? Joe Rosenberg said, and it's in that box, the truth is the United States of America simply is nowhere to be found in the Bible. This may be painful for many to hear. This may be difficult for many to accept. Nevertheless, the fact remains the, U, not, the U.S. is never directly mentioned or specifically referenced in Bible history or in Bible prophecy. It just isn't. Israel is mentioned. Iran, Persia, Iraq, Babylon, Russia, Central Asia, Turkey, Libya, Lebanon, Sudan, Egypt, Greece, Jordan, Syria, the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, and Europe, the revived Roman Empire, the ten-nation confederacy. And yes, by the way, throw in China and the kings of the east, and yet, no America. Why? It's clear that something must happen to America that takes America off the world stage as a superpower. Because if America remained the most powerful nation, it would be odd for Scripture to exclude it. Why then is America not mentioned? I want to give you a number of reasons that it may be that America is removed from the world stage when it comes to end time prophecy. Let me give you some credible reasons. Here's the first one. Number one, we will be attacked from other nations. It is, I, I think it is important when you, when you think about history and when you think about the state of our nation that there are nations that absolutely hate us. Russia hates us. Iran hates us. They hate Israel. Israel is the little Satan. America, in the eyes of the Islamic Republic, is the great Satan. China hates us. North Korea hates us. And just think of the various scenarios. Think of the possibility of nuclear warfare. Russia has it. China has it. Imagine what will happen if rogue nations get it, like Iran or North Korea, if they get it. Think of the terror cells that right now are in this country. And think of the possibility that they would detonate something on American soil. And that is a real possibility. Just 11 days ago, there was a headline, November the 24th. The headline reads this. U.S. Put that headline up, please. U.S. vulnerable to Chinese electromagnetic attack, experts say. An electromagnetic pulse attack is, is when it is det detonated, get this, 300 miles above the earth in the atmosphere that will cause all of the electrical components potentially in the United States to go out. Not for a week, not for two weeks. They estimate that it could go up to a year. And by the way, Iran has been practicing launching missiles up to 300 miles in the atmosphere off of freighter boats. I wonder what they're preparing for. Number two, second credible reason I suggest is the second U.S. Civil War. You and I have lived through the first pandemic 
in our lifetime. And whether you, whether you experienced it firsthand or whether you watched it on TV, you think of what came. We watched and saw cities burn, authorities ignored, statutes torn down, schools renamed. American heroes like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, even Abraham Lincoln. We saw the defund police movement sweep across this nation. And even in some areas, the call was not to defund, but to dismantle the police. And the result is that ambush-style attacks on law enforcement has more than doubled compared to the same time frame of 2020, just this year. Bill Schneider, professor of policy, government, and international affairs at George Mason University said, and I quote, nothing is ever permanent, but we are broken. I'd say this is the most divided we've been since the Civil War. We have seen things with our own eyes in the past two years that just a few years ago, we would have said it is unthinkable. But a second civil war is a frightening possibility. Let me show you on the screen some headlines that have just come recently. On November the 26th, California Apple Store hit in latest smash and grab in broad daylight. On the 27th, Los Angeles area looters target Home Depot, Bottega Veneta stores on Black Friday. The next day, two Best Buy stores in Minnesota looted all get away, report says. We have watched them when they've targeted and gone into stores and security guards can't touch them. They can't do anything. In fact, sometimes the security guards have been attacked. Some have been killed. And it's like a free-for-all. It's like, it's like anarchy. It's, it's like there is no authority whatsoever. Stephen Chapman, a member of the Chicago Tribune's editorial board, observed, and I quote, Modern America is sharply polarized, battered by political furies and divided as never before. Modernization is disappearing, excuse me, moder moderation is disappearing. We are told, as Americans increasingly shun people of different views, we are split between hostile groups, each with its own TV networks, fast food chains, or sporting apparel. Fox News versus MSNBC, Chick-fil-A versus Chipotle, Under Armour versus Nike. Extreme vocal ideologues are gaining ground on both the right and the left. One-third of likely voters, a poll found, think we're on the verge of a civil war. I put in your notes, the Rasmussen reports, June of 2009 said, and I quote, it is likely that the United States will experience a second civil war sometime in the next five years. The third credible reason, I believe, for America's absence could possibly be an economic freefall. An economic freefall. Think for a moment that right now, today, we are $29 trillion in debt. I put in your notes, unfounded debt could spell America's demise. The United States, folks, in the United States, they owe, we owe $87,000 per citizen. If we want to pay off the debt, every one of your children, every one of us, $87,000, if everybody in America chips in, we'll take care of the debt. Two years ago, it was 68400 The United States owes, for every taxpayer, $229,700 per taxpayer. Two years ago, it was 183000 The U.S. currently has, get this, $161 trillion in unfunded debt and liabilities. 
Two years ago, it was $125 trillion in unfunded liabilities. The trajectory we're on is unsustainable and could result in economic doom and freefall. But there's a fourth credible reason, and that is moral collapse. On November the 19th, a headline stated this, New Hampshire school district says football coach suspended student for saying there are only two genders. The same day, another headline, audio exposes California teachers' efforts to subvert parents and recruit kids to LGBTQ plus clubs. Let me read to you another one. It's not on the screen. Florida School Board, this was on October the 28th. Florida School Board member takes elementary school students on field trip to gay bar. I don't find that humorous at all. That's my, that's my ridge. It's my bracken. It's my tag. In fact, the school board member said that they were so honored to do that. In fact, the Broward County School Board member posted photos of the field trip to their Facebook page. 20% of the mobile devices, of the mobile devices, 20% of mobile device searches today in this country are for pornography. 90% of boys and 60% of girls are exposed to the internet porn by the age of 18. Porn sites are more visit, attract more visitors each month than Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter combined. 30% of the internet content is porn. Recently, there was a headline that said, quote, Harvard's new atheist chaplain, and here was his comment, quote, we can be good without God. Just Thursday, three days ago, Chicago Public Schools eliminating sex-specific restrooms to increase gender equity. Listen very carefully to me. Scripture is crystal clear that God's wrath will not be held back forever. I understand that God's wrath is not a popular subject today. I understand that most churches won't even touch it. But it's imperative that you and I know that God's wrath will not be held back forever. You see examples in the Bible of his direct wrath, the deluge, the flood that destroyed this world. When God directly destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, when God sent the plagues to Egypt in Exodus 7 to 11, for the past seven weeks we've talked about God's wrath that will come on, on this world from Revelation 6 to 19, the tribulation period, the seven years. But there's also God's eternal wrath. The Bible says that one of these days something's going to happen to Satan. After he's released during, after the thousand year millennial period, and we're going to touch on that this next week in the message, the final warning. The Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, watch this, forever and ever a recipient forever of God's wrath. But the Bible also talks about the, the wrath of God being eternal when it comes to humanity, you and me. In Revelation 20, verse 15, the Bible says, and anyone, do you hear that? Anyone. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. But there's a lesser known wrath, and that is the wrath of abandonment. When God withdraws, when God just lets you go at it and he moves his blessings away, 
when he removes his hand and he removes his help. And by the way, that happens little by little. And what I want to do is I want to take you through the four stages of God's abandonment. And they're all found in Romans chapter 1. The first one is this. Number one, the first stage of God's abandonment. And by the way, when he abandons an individual or when he abandons a nation, the first step is this. Number one, it begins when God is rejected. Romans chapter 1 verse 21. The Bible says, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. You see... Rejection of God always, say the word always, always always triggers moral collapse. There has been a massive shift in America in the past three decades. And today, if we think it's moved, today it's moving at a a breakneck speed. It's almost unbelievable what is happening before our eyes when it comes to the moral fiber and fabric of America. It's being shred to no ends. Second stage, sexual sin runs wild. Verse 24, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie, for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. You know, I think we will all agree that America is saturated with sexual sin. And when you think it couldn't get any worse, it does. And perversion is running rampant. God is rejected. Sexual sin runs wild. The third stage of God's abandonment is homosexuality is accepted. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the, the men, leaving their natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. One of the indicators uh, that a nation is being abandoned by God is when homosexuality is both accepted and sanctioned. And let me remind each of us that today, same-sex marriage in America is settled law. And to oppose it automatically brings the wrath of our culture upon us. I realize why churches don't want to talk about things like this. But God does. But that leads to a fourth stage. And that is immorality is protected and celebrated. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, Full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispered, backbiters, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Folks, this is pulling our nation into a situation that is it's inescapable. America 
is most definitely on the road to God's abandonment. The reality is all four of these reasons for America's absence in prophecy, whether alone or in combination, are possible. But my personal view is the reason that America is not found in Scripture and not a dominant world superpower like we have been is number five, the rapture. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always, say the word always, always, always be with the Lord. Therefore, listen, comfort one another with these words. What we've been talking about in end times prophecy during the seven year tribulation we're not going to be here. We're going to be with the Lord Jesus in heaven. But can you imagine for a moment the workforce that is depleted, the economy that is shattered in pieces? Can you imagine the fear and the chaos and the trauma? Everything in this nation will be altered there won't be a single strata of our society that will be unaffected. And for all practical purposes, Ichabod is written over our nation. The glory has departed. I want to remind you that in the midst of the moral and spiritual decline in our nation. There's a reason why God's judgment has been withheld. And the main reason is the Abrahamic covenant. I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you. And thus far, though undeserving, we are the recipient of God's unconditional promise and his everlasting promise to Israel because we have been the greatest ally of Israel to this day. But when the rapture takes place, every Christian is taken out. Everyone that believes in the Abrahamic covenant, can you imagine what the attitude will be in the midst of chaos and pain. And you think of all the stuff that we've experienced just in the last two years. If, if you think of all the immorality in our lifetime, where it's come from. From the time when I was a little boy, if you propositioned a girl, she'd slap you in the face. Until now, everything goes. Everything's accepted. Can you imagine... When every Christian is gone, and watch this, God moves the restrainer to where no longer is the Holy Spirit residing in people because the people that the Holy Spirit resides has been gone. They, they've been taken to heaven. I will tell you what will happen. I believe that this nation along with whatever else that I've talked about this morning. When the rapture takes place, this nation will turn its back on Israel, and I hope not until then. And we'll join the rest of the nations. I think there's reason potentially to believe that we'll be a part, but we will be a minor part. We'll probably be a part of the revived Roman Empire, even during the Russian Islamic War, if we're if we're apart, I think we 
We may complain, but that's all we'll do. We won't come to Israel's defense. No one will, but God. But when this nation turns its back on Israel and joins the rest of the nations, God will completely abandon America. I close with a quote by a prophecy teacher by the name of Jeff Kinley. And I quote, He describes the post-rapture America. What follows the rapture is a political, is political, economic, and moral chaos in this country. A colossal void of truth will be left behind. And unrestrained sin will begin swallowing up an entire society. All across the country, this scenario will become one of confusion, chaos, fear, resulting in rampant crime, robberies, and murders. A nationwide panic attack will grip the country. Because of the rapture, a significant portion of America's population will be gone, leaving huge voids in virtually every strata of society. With anarchy and chaos reigning, America will be paralyzed and officially no longer a major player in world affairs. And like a heavy blanket, darkness falls on an entire nation. In the time it takes for you to bat an eye, our country will be transformed from the land of the free to the home of the abandoned. Before the sun rises, she will go from being a global superpower to a drowning nation struggling to survive. But I have an even more personal question for you today. I want you to think for a moment, would you? Of what it will be if you are abandoned by God. You say, well, Ken, I'm a Christian. Listen carefully. Not everybody that says they're a Christian is a Christian. If there has never been a time in your life where you understood, I am a sinner and I need a Savior and I turn from my sin the way I've lived because I know I'm under the condemnation of God and I know the only way to heaven is through Jesus because Jesus said I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one gets to the Father except through me. And it was on the cross when Jesus took your sin and my sin and he put him on his son and Jesus paid the penalty. He suffered God's abandonment. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that you and I don't ever have to experience that forsakenness. And Jesus shed his blood because where there's no shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But it's not the blood of animals. It's not the blood of any human being that's only in the flesh. It, it was God. God's blood, Jesus shed his blood. Sinless, spotless, Jesus shed his blood so that our sin could be forgiven. But it's only forgiven when we turn from our sin and we repent and we turn to Jesus and we say, however you say it, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me. I receive your son as my Savior. Hear me and hear me well. For the first 26 years of my life, all the years as a teenager, all the years as a young adult, I sat in services like this. I attended churches only that told the truth like this. And I sat where you sit and I walked out service after service, week after week, month after month, year after year, politely, Nobody knowing but me, stiff-arming God. I was in an automobile accident. A semi-truck ran into my 1968 Opel sports car. Shattered the windshield. 
All I remember was laying on the ground when the squad came. They got me up. I had passed out. The blood was coming down. Next thing I know, I'm looking up at lights. Next thing I know, I'm in traction for a long time. If I die in that wreck, I'm not here. I'm in hell. But if I died before I finished this message, I'm in heaven. Because to be absent from the body is to be present to the Lord. I am not going to be abandoned by God. You know why? Because I've met God on his terms. Now listen carefully. I'm as serious as I could possibly ever be. You are going to spend eternity with God or you will be abandoned by God and you will be a recipient of God's wrath forever and ever and ever and ever. And the leader of the pack will be Satan, the false prophet, the Antichrist, and every human being that has refused God's free gift of salvation. And the reality is, it's your choice. It was my choice. I chose Jesus. And I am more grateful for that decision today than I've ever been in my life. It's one thing for a nation to be abandoned by God. It's a whole nother thing for you or me to be abandoned by God. And whether you're sitting in this worship center, watching me live stream, listening to this during the week, are you absolutely confident that you're going to heaven? If not, today is the day you need to settle it. You need to suck up the pride. You need to humble yourself before God and simply ask him to save you from your sin. You can do that right now. Every head bowed, please, every eye closed. You say, Ken, I'm ready. Here's what I want to do. I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. I'm going to pray out loud. You pray this just between God and you. You make it your prayer. Forget I'm here. This is between you and God. I'll pray out loud. You pray just between God and you. Let me lead you. God... Thank you for loving me. And thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. In this moment, I admit to you, I am a sinner and I deserve hell. But I don't want to spend eternity there. I want to spend eternity with you, God. I open my heart to your son. Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. I receive you, Jesus, as my Savior and as my Lord. I am trusting nothing and no one but you, Jesus. I'm turning from my sin, and I'm turning to you. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer and forgiving me of my sin. Thank you, God, for bringing me into your forever family. While our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, if just then you prayed and you meant it, all I want to ask you to do is this. Right where you're seated, would you just lift your hand and take it down in a moment? And by doing, you're saying, Ken, I meant it. I prayed. I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Would you lift it up wherever you are? God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you, sir. Thank you. You may put it down. While our heads are still bowed, nothing could happen today that would be more precious than what just did. People asking Jesus Christ to come into their life. That's the greatest glory God ever gets when someone turns from their sin and turns to him. But I want to ask all of us today, while our heads are bowed, Only God knows, as Brooks said at the beginning, only God knows the time when he's going to turn to his son and say, go get my kids. But I do know this. If I have any sense of Bible prophecy, 
The time is getting short. We've seen it before our eyes in the last few years, and it is happening, as I said, at breakneck speed. So what does that mean for you and me? Number one, let's live holy lives. Let's not be ridiculous. Let's be authentic. Let's not be weird. Let us be attractive. But oh my goodness, let's live lives that pleases Jesus. And secondly, it's time to wake up and to understand that the reason he's left us here is to be witnesses for him. And however it is effective with you, would you please let the remainder of your life be used to let other people know, not just by the way you live, but by what you say to them. Let them know how to spend eternity with God. Father, today I thank you, even in the midst of of realizing that um, the nation that I've lived in for every single moment of my life, from the day I was born to the day I became a full-fledged citizen of this nation by birth, that this nation has dramatically changed and will one day be abandoned by you. But until I have no more breath and until there is no more Northwest Bible, I pledge to you, Father, that we will tell people the truth, that God loves them. Regardless of what their life is like, God loves them. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. I thank you, God, that there was never a day when you hated me. You didn't hate me until I came to you. You hated me from the moment I was born. You you didn't hate me. You loved me. You loved me. In the midst of when I could not care about you, you loved me. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so, Father, today I thank you that I get to be a part of a church like Northwest Bible. And may we be an effective ministry for you. And in a day when a world, even churches, have made you as almost a weak, mamby-pamby God, I close this service by quoting that great passage in Jude. Now unto him who is able to keep you falling and to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and evermore. And everyone said, Amen. Here's the preview to next week.